Okay, so I'd like to um, start with this picture. Do you know what it is? What is this? It's not so difficult. Um, you you may not you may not have ever seen uh, this one, but once you know the answer, you will understand. This is central quantities. You can understand why this is called central quantities because in the center of muscle fibers you see something round in shape, right? That this is why this is called central quantities. It's not that difficult. So even for a small kid, right? If you tell them, oh, this is central quantities, pro probably next week they can make a diagnosis very easy. But my real question is whether you can make a diagnosis of central quantities without muscle biopsy. What do you think? It's a, a bit tricky question because nowadays you can do a whole genome or whole exome sequencing and you may find you know, some mutations in the causative gene for um, central core disease, that is RYR1 gene. But it's very tricky because not all the variants in uh, RYR1 gene are really associated with uh, central core disease. You know, RYR1 variant may also be um, causative for other myopathies like uh, multi core disease or uh, central nuclear myopathy or malignant hyperthermia. So it's very tricky. So identifying variant doesn't necessarily mean central quantities. So because you can see the definition of this disease is morphology, right? Appearance. So by definition, you need muscle biopsy to say this is central quantities. And this is also the case in other muscle diseases as well. This is called Nemali myopathy. This is called Nemali myopathy because this structure is called Nemali body, right? You already learned this one. This one is central nuclear myopathy because normally, you know, nucleus of the myofiber is located at the periphery. But, you know, in this disease, you know, in this case, many fibers have nuclei in the center of myofibers. This is why this is called central nuclear myopathy. This one, well, looks like myotube. Myotube is uh, like immature of, of myofiber. They are not myotubes, but looks like. This is why this is called myotubular myopathy. These are all correct, collectively called congenital myopathy. So especially congenital myopathy, all histor historically defined by you know, morphological features. So by definition, you need muscle biopsy. And actually, in even in other subcategories of muscle disease, like inflammatory myopathy or other myopathy, all of them are at least partly defined by morphological features. So to understand, you know, the muscle disease, you need to understand muscle, bio, muscle pathology. Okay, so then I'd like to first discuss you know, muscle biopsy, then fixation, then how to read. So I, I will talk, you know, about, I will explain everything in one hour. This is a very difficult job, so I, I need to, you know, go through very quickly. First of all, muscle biopsy is done, has to be done to make a diagnosis of muscle disease, but not neurologic, you know, neurogenic disease or neuromuscular dis junction disorder. So this is a very important point because Muscle disease is defined by muscle pathology. That's uh, pathological features. That's why we need muscle path pathology for the diagnosis of muscle disease. But for neurogenic disease, may we can say this is neurogenic disease, but we don't know what kind of neurogenic disease by pathology. It can be ALS, can be SMA, can be Charcot-Marie tooth, or can be CIDP, can be anything actually. We can't tell. All we can tell is this is some kind of neurogenic disease. So that's not, this is not so useful. And neuromuscular junction disorders, often we don't see any abnormality. Don't know, just no specific changes. So this is a painful pr procedure, but you don't get much. So basically muscle biopsy is done when you suspect the possibility of muscle disease. Okay, but even among muscle diseases, in for some conditions, there is no, you know, uh, there are not very much indications for some conditions. 
the most representative ones are myotonic dystrophy and FSHD, facial scapular humeral muscular dystrophy. Mus myotonic dystrophy, you, if you do muscle biopsy, you can see a variety of changes, but none of them is actually diagnostic, right? And in contrast, if you do EMG, you can detect myotonic discharge, and also clinical pictures are very, you know, characteristic. So you can make a clinical diagnosis and do EMG and genetic testing. No, you don't need muscle biopsy. FSHD as well. FSHD is a very interesting disease. If you look at the patient, some muscles are completely gone, but other muscles are almost normal. So it's like, more or less like all or none. So if you do muscle biopsy from severely affected area, probably you will not see anything. You, what you get is fat, no muscle. But if you do muscle biopsy from well-preserved area, you may not see anything. Maybe can even be normal, so you can't tell. But clinical features are usually very characteristic. Right? And this one, you should do genetic testing rather than muscle biopsy. And also, mutation screening is available for a number of disorders. The first one is available, became available was Duchenne muscular dystrophy or Becker muscular dystrophy. I'm not sure uh, the situation in your country, but at least MLPA, which can detect exonic deletions or duplications are available almost everywhere in the world. In Japan, uh, around 50% of congenital mu muscular dystrophy patients have unique type of congenital muscular dystrophy, which is called Fukuyama congenital muscular dystrophy. This is caused by specific mutation in Fukutin gene. So we can just, you know, check that uh, particular mutation by PCR. This is very easy test. So we do this one. We never do a biopsy nowadays. But the list is really in increasing, right? So depending on the availability, so we, maybe you can do genetic testing first. And this, the wor this world is changing. Nowadays, whole exome, whole genome sequencing, you know, became more, much more and more easily available. So I think in the United States, they do actually uh, whole exome or whole genome sequencing first before muscle biopsy. This is partly because whole exome sequencing, the price is getting lower and lower, but muscle biopsy or muscle, even muscle imaging are still very expensive. Probably the biopsy itself is not that expensive, but pathologists charge a lot, according to my friend in the United States. Uh, although we do read muscle pathology for free, completely free, but so it depends on the country as well. Okay, <clears throat> so then if you decide muscle to do to perform muscle biopsy, so when you do it, so age. <clears throat> At which age can you start muscle biopsy? Actually, you can do it at any age. Even on the day of birth, you can do it if you really need it. But usually when you, when, when you need muscle biopsy on day one, patients are probably really have severe condition, right? So most likely, general condition is very, very poor. So I think you have to do, you have to take care of that part first, general condition first, before muscle biopsy. So that's why practically muscle biopsy is usually not done on day one, but if you really need it, you can do it. And how about the age, you know, up the upper limit? There is no upper limit. Actually, we have uh, muscle biopsy is biopsy sample from over age 100. So we can do it at any age, actually, no, no problem. How about the disease stage? This is very important. So as I mentioned, if you biopsy from really affect, re severely affected muscle, you will not get anything. You will not get any myofibers. Then all you can say is, oh, this is really in the advanced stage. That's all we can say, and we never know whether this is myopathic disease or even neurogenic disease or anything. It's very difficult. So advanced stage should be avoided. And um, actually the last part is very important. Like until 20, maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 
we often said that if you have a case suspected to have myositis, you should do muscle biopsy as quickly as possible, and you should start steroid as soon as possible. That's what we used to say, but now we changed. Why? Look at this one. This looks like, really looks like muscle tissue. You see necrotic fiber, regenerative fiber, and a lot of fibrous tissue. This is really dystrophic. But actually, this patient was a 16-year-old girl who had eight years history of progressive muscle weakness, and she was clinically diagnosed with some kind of muscular disorder. And muscle biopsy was postponed and postponed and postponed. And at age eight, uh, 16, eight years after the onset, finally came to our hospital and received biopsy. And turned out that she had myositis. Some type, subtype of myositis is called immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. I will give a lecture on the day after tomorrow. But anyway, <clears throat> this was myopathy, you know, inflammatory myopathy. But if you, even if you do, if you start, you know, treatment like steroid or whatever, with this much fibrosis, of course, efficacy is very much limited. I don't think she will be normalized too late, right? So it means that you have to make a diagnosis as early as possible and start treatment. Another example I'd like to share with you is that this is a slide given from a former president of uh, Patients Association for Pompey Disease in Japan. They had two daughters. The elder daughter had asthma since age one, and she was followed. And around four years, uh, four years of age, she was found to have liver dysfunction, probably because ASP ALT was elevated. Then after that, she was uh, the height was lower, so she was fo uh, followed up in a different hospitals. Okay, so basically just follow them. Younger daughter, two years younger, had very similar condition. So she had common cold, then found to have asthma. So she was followed at the same hospital and the liver dysfunction. And finally, she developed cardiac dysfunction. And also uh, papillary muscles was found to be thickened. So this, at this hospital, they finally suspected the possibility of pompe disease and they did screening and found it was positive, but it was too late and she died. And of course, her sister should have the same disease. And of course, they checked it and the diagnosis was made. And finally, enzyme replacement therapy was started. Of course, diagnosis was very much delayed. But something, so maybe in the beginning it was difficult to make a diagnosis, but something I was really sad about this story is this one. At this hospital, when she was found to have, you know, liver enzyme elevation, they actually suspected a possibility of muscular dystrophy because her muscle, proximal muscle was weak and also CK was elevated. But they did not do muscle biopsy because they thought, okay, for myositis, you have to do muscle biopsy immediately. But muscular dystrophy, maybe we can do it sometime later, right? Then they didn't actually postpone, postpone, and finally they didn't do it. But if they did muscle biopsy here, I'm 100%, 200% sure that we could make a diagnosis, pompidity. And of course, she survived. And this girl, also much better, and they started treatment, but she she can she never walked. Okay, she was on wheel on wheelchair all, all, all the time. So it means that muscle biopsy should not be delayed. If you think you need muscle biopsy, you should do it as soon as possible. Of course, it doesn't have to be today, but at least in one or two weeks, I think you you should do it because treatable condition are increasing, including, of course, myositis and also competitive or whatever. And they can look like muscular dystrophy, right? And for those treatable conditions, all, the, all of them, earlier diagnosis will give you better result, right? So I think you should do it as soon as possible. And you will get nothing by postponing the muscle biopsy, okay? If you do it, you should do it earlier. 
not you will lose nothing. Another important point before doing muscle biopsy, you have to carefully choose the biopsy site. First of all, we should um, choose the muscle which is mildly to moderately affected because as, again, as I mentioned, if it is really severely affected, what you get will be fat, not myocardial. So mild to moderate, to say, my, you know, manual muscle testing, level four, MRC four muscle. But more precisely, you really high, you know, performing muscle imaging is highly recommended nowadays. This is a um, muscle CT at thigh level and also calf muscle level from the from a patient with limbogar muscle disorder. Look at this thigh muscle. Of course, muscle disease, in muscle disease, proximal muscles are more preferentially affected. That's what we learned. But look at this muscle. Not all thigh muscles are equally affected, right? So it means that proximal muscle weakness is not enough at all. You know, even the proximal muscles are really very differently or even selectively involved. So this looks really normal, right? But this muscle, this muscle is complete, almost completely gone. So you should not take this one. Maybe this one not really good as well. So maybe something like this or something like this should be chosen you know, in this case. And also, if this is a muscular disorder, but if you suspect the possibility of myositis, you should perform MRI. So in Japan, at least, now we said that muscle imaging is a must when you have a patient with muscle disease. Yes. So, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm involved in a board examination with a committee. So I make a test for them, you know, for board examination. So I always say, include the muscle imaging is necessary or not for when you have muscle disease. And if, you, if they say no, I think I, I want to kick them out. Something like this. This is very important. And also another consideration is the um, suitability of the uh, for the pathological analysis. You know that there are actually I will mention this, but there are three myofiber types: type one, two A, and two B. And textbook said that those three fibers components are one third, one third, one third, and they are distributed in a checkerboard pattern or a mosaic pattern. But this is not always correct because type 1 fiber is, for example, it's an anti-gravity muscle, like red muscle or slow twitch muscle. So, for example, if you perform muscle biopsy from paraspinal muscle, you have more type 1 fibers from the beginning. In, on the other hand, for example, in congenital myopathy, you often find type 1 fiber predominant, which means you have a lot of type 1 fibers. This is a very important finding to make a diagnosis of congenital muscle. But if you do muscle biopsy from paraspinal muscle and if you find type 1 fiber predominant, you never know whether this is from the beginning or from by the disease. You can't tell, right? So you better choose the muscle in for which my each myer fiber type, the component is one third, one third, one third, and distributed in the checkerboard. This type of, you know, standard is established. That type of muscle should be chosen. That is usually biceps brachii or quadriceps or delta or something like that. But you must be careful because if they are not correct, you know, appropriately, appropriately uh, involved, of course you should avoid it. And if one particular muscle is the only one which is affected, of course you have to biopsy from them, from that side. And another one, gastrocnemius should be avoided. But again, if gastrocnemius is the only muscle affected, of course you have to do. Why you have to avoid gastrocnemius? It is very difficult, it's often very difficult to differentiate chronic myopathic and chronic neuropathic condition. This is very difficult. Okay, and I, I, I talked about muscle imaging. So now we know that the in hereditary muscle disease, almost all hereditary muscle diseases, the certain muscles are very much selectively involved. So by you know, by the recognition of the pattern of muscle involvement on muscle imaging, we can, some people say that we can even make a diagnosis 
of muscle disease, or at least narrow down the you know, differential diagnosis. So muscle imaging is very important. And again, just saying proximal weakness is not enough at all nowadays. And again, for myositis, you need, MR, uh, you need MRI because we want to see edema. And edema cannot be de detected by muscle CT. And this is, for, for example, this is immune-mediated necrotizing myopathy. See, those backside muscles have, have show myoedema, but not in quadriceps. So in this case, you know, in many, well, at least previously, in many hospitals, people just routinely perform muscle biopsy from quadriceps. In this case, if you do muscle biopsy from quadriceps, I think it will be normal, completely normal muscle. But you have to choose this one, right? So I think muscle MRI is very useful. So actually, when we receive muscle samples, we always ask the physician to send us muscle imaging data as well. Okay, so now muscle biopsy. We usually use, we, you need to use anesthesia, otherwise it's very, very painful. And then for pediatric, pediatric patients, we routinely use general anesthesia. But for adults, typically you usually use only local anesthesia. But we are, we always have discussion about this one because this is painful. Right, even for adults, maybe general, using general anesthesia is safer and good, better. You know, in I, I don't know the situation in your country, but uh, in Japan, for endoscopy, like a GI upper GI endoscopy, even for that, actually, some clinics use general anesthesia, like a propofol, and they say that propofol, while you are having propofol, you feel very good. And that's why actually some anesthesiologists are addicted to it and found dead in the in toilet or something. You know, there are, sometimes you hear news something like this. So if you use propofol, and if patients feel very good, so in case you need second biopsy, they may be happy to have it again, right? So maybe it's nice to have to use general anesthesia. But in, anyway, so in practically at the moment, I think for adults, we use only local anesthetics. This is very important. Local anesthetics will necrotize myocytes. So it means that you should not inject local anesthetics into the muscle. So all you can use, I mean, anesthetize is subcutaneous tissue, right? So it means that it is really painful when you take muscle. Okay, so not injected to the muscle. This is very important. Okay, so when you do, so you do anesthesia, you make skin incision, and you will separate the uh, subcutaneous tissue. This part is very different depending on the people. So if you do muscle biopsy from a boy, from a young boy, uh, and from biceps, usually subcutaneous fat is very, very thin. So you open it, you almost immediately see fascia. But if you do muscle biopsy uh, from a relatively obese patient, especially from thigh muscle, the subcutaneous fat can be some centimeters. So you really have to open it and, you know, and dig it out. Otherwise, you will not see fascia. But anyway, if once you reach the fascia, you will make incision and open it, and you will take that muscle and you close it. And uh, something very important is uh, I already mentioned this one. The size is very important because normally in mo most in most muscle diseases, diagnostic finding is not everywhere. Usually, they are distributed in a patchy pattern or even in certain only in certain areas. Right, so basically, if you, you know, get a really small sample, the possibility that you lose important finding will be really high, right? Right. So it means that you, the larger the sample is, the higher that the probability of the getting the diagnostic, you know, finding will be higher, right? So the best, you know, in terms of making a diagnosis, the best situation is 
to get the whole muscle, everything. But of course you can't, right? And then patient will have big problems. That's why you have to choose, you know, uh, limit the size. So I think that many people in the previous generation, the professors in, in the previous generations actually uh, made try and errors. Then finally they, they found the pencil size is practically the best one for adults at least, right? And of course for kids, little kids, you should make it smaller. But anyway, especially pediatricians, many pediatricians think that, okay, I want to be so invasive, okay, for this baby or something. So they, they want to, you know, minimize the sample size as much as possible. And sometimes they just send us like a, <laughs> rice <laughs> something so it's very difficult yeah right of course pencil size may be too big for baby still you still need you know bigger one and otherwise you will lose the diagnosis so it, it's not actually for the patient so you you should you know if you decide to do muscle biopsy i think you should take certain amount of muscle this is the, for the patient and don't tie up the sample. If, if you ask the surgeon who, would, who, ha, who has no experience of muscle biopsy, sometimes they take the sample just as vessel. So you, they tie up, you know, like this, and they take it out. But, you know, by tying up, of course, you destroy everything, right? The structure, of course, you shouldn't. And don't use the electrocautery. Of course, if you, and once you take out the sample, then you can do with it. But before that, you shouldn't. And another important point is you should wrap, you know, sample should not be dry, okay? That's why after taking the sample, it should be wrapped by wet gauze. But this wetness is also a key factor. If it is very wet, actually the sample will absorb water and you'll get a lot of artifact, freezing artifact. So this has to be well squeezed, okay? until the water does not come out. Then you should wrap it. Okay, because the time is limited, I will not show you the video, but we have video, which was made in collaboration with Syria Hospital in Thailand. And this is, I, I, well, I want to be, I don't want to be arrogant, but this, this, the, these videos are very nice, I have to say. And the uh, English version, Thai version, and Japanese version are available. You, you can choose whichever you want. Yeah, so this is the one. Very nice music, but unfortunately I will skip. <laughs> you can <laughs> watch by yourself. And uh, so now fixation. So historically, we use freeze fixation, but not formally fixation for muscle. Because for muscle pathology, we do a lot of enzyme histochemistry like SDH, COX, ATPase, or Arana, or enzyme, all enzymes. But if you use formal fixation, proteins will be denatured. And it means that, of course, enzyme, all enzymes are protein, right? So enzymatic activity will be killed. So of course, we can evaluate enzymatic activity at all. So yes, almost all, you know, muscle pathology laboratory in the world, they don't do formal Fixation. But some laboratories, which has pathology background, general pathology background, they insist doing this one. It's okay, you can do it. But important one, this one. So major part, the most important part, part you know, the main part should be frozen. And only the little part, you can do it if you really want. Okay, so this is not important at all. And for EM, electron microscopy, you need good hard time fixation. Muscle cell culture is not necessary for the pathological diagnosis, but in our hospital, we do this a routine. Okay, again, the size is pencil size. Apparently, the, the size of the pencil is the same everywhere in the world, and the usually hexagonal, right? And the long, longer in diameter is eight millimeters all over the world. So eight millimeter size, column shape, muscle biopsy sample should be taken. Okay, there are two methods for freeze fixation. One is liquid nitrogen and isopentane method. The other one is acid and dryers. 
Basically, muscle should be frozen as quickly as possible with as low temperature as possible. Okay? The practically available lowest temperature liquid or material is liquid nitrogen, which is minus 196 degrees. Then you may wonder why you don't put it directly into the liquid nitrogen, because this is the coldest, right? You want the coldest temperature. This is coldest, right? Why? Because liquid nitrogen, once it is even a little bit warmed, it will be quickly turned to gas, nitrogen gas. You know, the gas, if, you know, uh, does not cool you or material so quickly, efficiently. So you can imagine. So, for example, refrigerator, inside the refrigerator, usually the temperature is 4 degrees. Okay? So in this type of hot country, if you open the freezer, uh, refrigerator and you put your head, you just feel cool and feel nicer, right? But, you know, have you ever been to sauna or we, we have a lot of hot springs, but anyway, so the, you know, after taking a hot, you know, hot bath, often, sometimes they have cold water bath as well. That is often 4 degrees. That is really cold. You feel really cold. The same 4 degrees. Liquid, if you are in the liquid, you will feel very cold. But if it is in, in the air, it doesn't, you don't feel that much cold. This is because gas, you know, the, the efficiency of heat what you say, conductance, it's not efficient, low, while liquid is very high. So it means that, you know, if you put the sample directly into the liquid nitrogen, you will be immediate, the sample will be immediately surrounded by low efficiency conductance gas. So it means that it won't be cooled that much, right? You know, this is one hand, almost like 120 degrees. The sample may be 20 degrees or even 30 degrees in Vietnam, right? So the difference is like 200 to 20 degrees. This is very hot, you know, from the viewpoint of liquid nitrogen, this is very, very hot. Imagine 220 degrees higher than you. Very hot, right? You, you will be burned immediately. So, something very hot will come in and the gas will surround this one. Then it means this will not be really cooled down. So we have to choose some liquid which cannot be immediately turned to gas, which was isopentane. So isopentane, of course, you should cool down isopentane as much as possible, as low as possible. The lowest temperature is in the liquid, liquid, liquid form is freezing point. After this, it will be solid, right? So this temperature is freezing point. For water, it is zero degree, right? And it is a mixture of water and ice. And then after that, everything will be, you know, ice become ice, then it will be minus rubber. So the, at the liquid status, the freezing point is the lowest. So lowest temperature, freezing point of isopentane is minus 160 degrees. So it means that if you use isopentane liquid nitrogen method, you fix the muscle at minus 160 degrees. Okay, this is the one point. Another method, acetone dry ice, I don't go into the detail, but with this method, you put the acetone and you put crushed dry ice one by one. And because dry ice, you cool down the acetone by dry ice. Dry ice is minus 79 degrees, and the freezing point is lo even lower, but of course, isopentane, sorry, the acetone will not go down beyond minus 79, right? So it means that with this method, you freeze the muscle at minus 79 degrees. Of course, my, one, minus 160 and minus 79, both of them are very cold, right? But the difference is 80 degrees, 81 degrees. 81 degrees higher than your body temperature will be over 100 degrees. Again, it's very, very hot, right? So it means that both of them are unusual, you know, 
unusually cold for us, but actually this is much colder. Actually, the difference is very big. And of course, this is much better. So in your hospital, actually, I'm sure you are from tertiary hospital. I think you should use this one. This is much better. Again, we have video, but for the sake of time, I will, not, of the I will not show you, so you can watch it by yourself. And once frozen, uh, the sample should not be, should not, ev never, ever defrosted. So you have to keep them in the deep freezer, minus 80 degrees. And when you put the sample into the deep freezer, it should be in the airtight vial. Otherwise, sample will be freeze dry. Dry. Okay. And for transportation, of course, you have to you all use you have to uh, you know carry always with dry ice. Otherwise, defrost it. Okay. And we keep them in the deep freezer like this. And I will skip this one. Anyway, don't frost the sample. This is a very important one. And with uh, we make a section by cryostat. Then we do variety of histochemical stains. This is uh, the one we routinely perform in our laboratory. And among them, HNE modified gomery trisome, NADH are the most important. And once you understand them, some people say that more than 90% of muscle disease can be diagnosed. And another one, ATPAs are actually more precisely, they are called myosin ATPs. This is done to differentiate fiber type. I will mention about this one. And after those anal analysis, we basically want to uh, separate neuropathic condition and myopathic condition. But most of the findings are actually myopathic conditions. Uh, and neuropathic finding is only, uh, there are only two actual, actual definitive neuropathic um, finding what one is group atrophy, the, the other one is fiber type grouping, and basically all others are myopathic change. Okay, so this is a normal muscle, and each fiber is not distributed uniformly, they make cluster. This is called fascicle. So, in terms of interstitium, there are two types of interstitium in this uh, picture. One is the space between fascicles. This is called perimygium. The other one is space between myofibers within the fascicle. This is called endomygium. So endomygium, perimygium, fascicle. These three terms are very important to understand the muscle pathology. So please do not forget th these three terms. You can forget everything else, but please do remember those three terms. This is they are very, very important. And if you look at the muscle sample, you, you may see other structures as well. This looks like vessel, right? But actually this is not the vessel because if this is the vessel, you, what you can see should be only blood vessel, uh, sorry, the blood cell, but they are not blood cells for sure. They look like myofibers. Actually, they are specialized myofibers called intracusal fibers. And this is peripheral nerve. This is actually muscle spindle, okay? And they are intramuscular nerve. And the intramuscular nerves are not always involved, uh, included, but sometimes you see it. And this is important. You can see inter nerve, intramuscular nerves here as well. And this actually, this is neuromuscular junction. So it means that most likely this is motor nerve, right? Actually, you sometimes do nerve biopsy, but sural nerve is basically sensory, right? So you never have a chance to do motor nerve biopsy, but this is more like a motor nerve biopsy, right? This is a precious opportunity to observe motor nerve, right? So you should observe this one as well, as well evaluate this one as well. Okay, so this is the magnified version of the normal muscle fiber. The fiber size, is 60 to 80 microns, uh, or maybe 50 to 70, but anyway. So if this is uh, larger than 100, we call it hypertrophic fibers um, in adult at least. And again, the space between myofibers is called endomyogen. 
Look at this end of my journey. What is present? Look at this one. Nothing, right? You can just see sleep, right? This is very important. This is very, very important point. In endomysium, nothing. Of course, if, you know, peripheral nerves or something comes in, of course, you see some fibrous tissue or something. But in other areas like this area, nothing. This is very important, okay? And another point is a, a myonuclear. Nucleus is present at the periphery, normally. Okay, then I'd like to discuss this one. Look at this one. In the endomysium, my germ. This is not white, right? You can see something pink. Yeah? This pink color is the same as this one. This is fibrous tissue. So you can immediately say that there is fibrosis. Right? Because there is nothing normally. But now you can see it. But you know, when young residents, you know, uh, are presenting a case report at the conference, they always say that, oh, there was interstitial, interstitial fibrosis and pointing out here. Right? Maybe the fibrous tissue maybe increased like 2%, 3%, but who can who can be sure, right? But here, you can be 100% sure because normally nothing, but you can see it, right? So when you evaluate fibrosis, you always have to look at endomysia, not perimysia. This is why we specifically use the term endomysia fibrosis. When we write a paper, when we present case, we always say endomysia fibrosis. Then reviewer will know that you know muscle pathology, right? <laughs> but, but if you just say interstitial fibrosis, then reviewers will be a little bit worried. I'm not sure if this guy <laughs> really understands muscle pathology or not. So this is a secret keyword, <laughs> okay? But this is very important. That's why I said endomysium. This is a very important term to understand. Okay, the next one, fascicle. They are fast, you know. Okay, so. In this, of course, this is an advanced stage, but you, can you recognize the original shape of the fascicle? No, because the, in the fat, by fat infiltration, the original shape of the fascicle is already lost, right? And by saying so, uh, and how much, uh, you know, at the advanced stage, the, the case is, uh, as you can tell. How about this one? How do you describe this one, right? This is very strange. So probably if you ask a small kid, they will say that, oh, at the bottom, there are many small ones and the upper part, big ones. I think they, they will say something like this. You know, they are correct, really correct. I think you will say the same probably. But if you use the term fascicle, it will, you, you know, it will be sound more professional. At the lower fascicle, all fibers are atrophic. At the upper fascicle, in the upper fascicle, most of them are hypertrophic. You now sound professional, right? <laughs> but the essence is the same. So the technicum should be used something like this. And the, so the all muscle fibers in one fascicle is atrophied. This is called large group atrophy. Okay? And in this fast, you know, atrophic fiber, you can see most of them are round in shape. So Round shape group atrophy. Uh, of course, group atrophy is indicate neurogenic condition, but the, if those atrophic fibers are round in shape, people believe that this is a congenital neuropathic condition. And in fact, this is a muscle from Wernick Hoffman or SMA1. Of course, nowadays we never do muscle biopsy from SMA1, but like 30 years ago, we did muscle biopsy for all neurogenic or whatever. And if you see uh, muscle pathology, will be like this. This is another example of large group atrophy. You may not, you may not think that this may not be a whole fascicle, but actually, probably this is a whole fascicle. And atrophy, you can see atrophy fibers, and so this is group atrophy, large group atrophy. But look at this. Most of the fibers are somehow elongated and a little bit angular. Right? So they, they are called small angular fibers. 
And this type of angular shaped atrophic fibers are seen in acquired condition, okay? Acquired or after birth, okay? This is actually a, a case of uh, with ALS. And again, of course, to make a diagnosis of ALS, you shouldn't do muscle biopsy, okay? This is not useful. How about this one? This one, you know. <laughs> you want to say, okay, you can say, you can say, what is this? Mm, yes, exactly. This is called perifascular atrophy because you can see atrophic fibers at the periphery of the fascicles, right? That's what, this is why it is called perifascular atrophy. You know, there are many findings, but may, not all of them actually, most of them are not really diagnostic. There are only few pathological, muscle pathological findings which are really diagnostic. This is one of them. If you see perifascular atrophy, you, you almost have diagnosis. This is Daman, Daman myofibers. Now we go into evaluate myofiber. The, one of the most important change you have to observe is necrosis and regeneration. In necrotic fiber, you know, normal fiber, even on HNA, you can see some pattern inside the myofiber. But in necrotic fiber, it's, you know, like a liquefied and pale in color. And in fact, this is you know, believed to be liquefied by protein, uh, yeah, and proteins. And then liquefied cytoplasm is cleaned up by macrophage. So macrophage come in. And at the same time, uh, around 2% of my nuclei have are actually stem cell, which we call satellite cells. And they start dividing like this and make um, regenerating fibers. So this process, yeah, and the regenerating fibers look like this. So uh, they have basophilic cytoplasm and enlarged myonuclei, right? Okay, so the, this is um, early regenerating fibers. Okay, so I will go through necrosis to regeneration. First, so this is a typical necrosis. This is around within 24 hours after necrosis, we see this type of change, okay? Uh, already macrophage come in, right? And after this regeneration starts one by one, and this is very early regeneration, maybe two, three days after necrosis, maybe this is like a five to seven days. Maybe this is like two weeks, 10 to two weeks, maybe three weeks, something like that. And in total, they say that one to 1.5 months, it takes 1.1, 1 .1, uh, let's say 1.5 months, one and a half months to return to normal. It takes one and a half months. So it means that if you see this one, okay, there was necrotic event just recently, right? But if you see this one, maybe there was necrotic event a few days ago. If you see this one, maybe one week ago, something like this. So regenerating fibers means, the presence of regenerating fibers means the presence of past necrotic events within one and a half months, right? Okay, let's look at this muscle. This is a muscle from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Of course, you see necrotic fibers, regenerating fibers. So it means that in this muscle, at least there were two necrotic events recently and relatively in the past, right? And, and actually, if you look at it more carefully, there are other regenerative fibers. This is almost, you know, regeneration has almost been completed. So it means that, you know, not even just two times, probably necrotic events occurred again and again and again in this muscle, right? In addition, there is endomyogenic fibrosis. You, already, you are already professional for this one, expert, right? Endomyogenic fibrosis. To get endomyogenic fibrosis, of course, you can't have endomyogenic fibrosis in one or two days or even just one or two weeks. I don't think you can get it. It takes a long time, years actually, months or even years. So this just by this HNE, you know, picture, you can already tell that this patient has chronic muscle disease, 
in which myofibrin necrosis occurs again and again and again repeatedly. This is clearly the nature of muscular dystrophy, right? So just by one picture of HME, you can already tell all the features. You can feel all the features of muscular dystrophy, right? Another form of necrosis is this one. This is very unique. You can see this is a you know, relative low magnification, so you can see fascicle, fascicle. But the whole, whole area, the muscle fibers are necrotized like this. And if you look at the NADHDR, I don't go into the detail, but the all activity is lost, right? So they are all necrotic fibers, but without macrophage invasion for some reason. The whole area of necrosis, this is, this actually is believed to be reflect, um, micro infarction, infarction of the muscle. And this is sometimes seen in dermatomyositis patients, dermatomyositis. I already showed this picture. This one, abnormality is this one, right? So nuclei, nucleus is present in the center. There are two possibilities to explain this change. One possibility is all of them may be regenerating fibers, right? So let's say if they, there was necrosis like one month ago, maybe one and a half month ago or whatever, they may be all regenerating fibers. But if that is the case, probably the patients will tell you that oh, one month ago I had a big problem, blah, 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 right? Because everything necrotized at one time, right? It must be a big accident or something. But it's not this, that is not the case in this patient because you can tell, again, you are an expert on this one, and endomyogenic fibrosis, right? It means that he has a chronic myopathic disease, not just like this, right? So it means that he has a chronic long, and actually you can also see fat infiltration. So he has chronic muscle disease with nucleus in the center of muscle, muscle fiber, right? So this is central nuclear myopathy. How about this one? You don't know what it is, right? Everything is destroyed. This is art fact. This sample was once defrosted, okay? This is another art fact. You can see a lot of holes, right? This is due to improper freezing or the sample was wrapped by two wet goals, yes. And if water is absorbed, it will be like this. So, of course, in a, you know, pathologist, you know, professor always said that pathology is always the, um, you know, the fighting with artifacts or something like that. Yes, that is true, actually. And artifacts, it really prevents the evaluation, precise evaluation. Then, then the very really important point about artifacts is they are irreversible. Okay, once you get it, there is no way to remove them. Okay, so the only way to avoid artifacts is not to make it. This is the only way. For these muscle pathologists, are powerless because we are not the one who make. You know, artifact. You are the one, <laughs> right? So you have to follow the you know the correct you know a procedure uh, for uh, sampling and fixation. This is another. So okay, and in terms of my fibers, you you sometimes see this type of vacuole. This is very unique vacuoles. You can see in one fiber you have very huge vacuole and with something amorphous inside base of the color. This pattern of, you know, uh, vacuole can be seen in only one disease. This is very characteristic. This is Pompe disease. And Pompe disease is important for us because this is treatable. There is enzyme replacement therapy available. And I showed this picture, but in younger onset case, in infantile onset case, Almost all fibers have vacuoles. And in childhood onset cases, selective, fi selective fibers. 
There are rare adult onset cases. This is sometimes very difficult to make a diagnosis because not all fibers have vacuoles. And in this particular case, all we found is this one. And this is totally different from a typical vacuole. And the interstitium. Okay. Previously, when we see this type of change, we almost always made a diagnosis of polymyositis. Right? You know what I mean. This one. But now we never make a diagnosis of myositis based on this one. Where are those, of course, lymphocytes, right? Where are those lymphocytes? Perimysin, right? So that's why I said three terms, perimysin. And they are surrounding, lymph, uh, surrounding the blood vessel. Lymphocytes are really like human beings. So if you have traffic accident, they will come and see, right? Traffic accident or whatever, fire or whatever. So this is called reactive uh, lymphocyte infiltration. So you will have actually necros necrotic fibers and regenerative fibers. They are like a traffic accident or a fire. So they come and see, this is reactive lymphocyte infiltration. And this is like a subway exit. So they just come out to see traffic action. So this is reactive. So it means that this is not specific, not at all. And actually this case, we already have diagnosis. This is limb garden of the vessel. This is a similar finding found in Damarman cycle. Of course, we often see, more often we see this type of change in Damarman cycle, but we never make a diagnosis of myositis just by this finding. This is non-specific, okay? This is very important. But this is different. What's the difference? Yes, endo, yes, endomysium. That's why I repeatedly said perimysium, endomysium, fascicle. Yeah? This is very important. So they are in the endomysium surrounding this one. This one is not necrotic. So it's not the traffic accident or whatever. It's like a peaceful residential area where you live. And your house is surrounded by these lymphocytes. And this guy is already in your house. So it means that those lymphocytes are, have really bad intention, right? It's not just come and see. And this is actually the pathological definition of polymyositis. If you see this, the diagnosis is polymyositis. And this is another example. You see non-necrotic fibers surrounded, and then you can even see the uh, invasion. So endomysial lymphocyte infiltration surrounding non-necrotic fibers and invasion into non-necrotic fibers. This is the definition, current definition of polymyositis. What it means that lymphocytes are attacking muscle fibers. Okay, this is the concept of polymyositis. And if you do immunohistochemistry, many of those lymphocytes are CD8 positive. CD8 is the mark of cytotoxic T cells. They are really toxic to myofiber, right? So this is the current concept. Yes, again, polymyositis, you should see this one. But you have, and it means that cytotoxic T cells are attacking fiber. But you have to be careful. If you see, in addition to this, if you see rim vacuoles or it's earlier phenomenon called P62 aggregate or TDP43, this type of aggregate, the diagnosis is changed to inclusion body myositis. And number of papers reported that, you know, pathologically diagnosed polymyositis, almost all cases later developed idea, inclusion body myositis. So now increasing number of muscle pathologists believe that polymyositis does not exist. At least pathologically defined polymyositis does not exist in this world. So in the last 10 years in our laboratory, I have never made a diagnosis of polymyositis pathologically. Okay. So I use most of my time. I will just quickly go through. I don't because of time, I, I will not go to modified Gomery trichome, but HNE is the most important one to characterize all the morphological changes. 
But modified Gomer trichrome is really a, you know, additional you know, uh, staining, which detects some structure which cannot be really visualized by HIV, like something. So that's why something you have to pick up has name, like nemaline body, rim vitals, tubular aggregate, and ragged. Right? But I don't want to go into that. And NADH is to visualize the intermyofibrillar network like this. And then by the pattern, there, there are names like, you know, central core, moth eating fibers, or after the lobulated fibers, and moth eating fibers like this. And finally, myosin ATPS. Myosin ATPS is used just to differentiate fiber types. There are three fiber types normally, type 1, 2A, and 2B. They can be, um, we use different pH conditions. Okay, at alkaline condition, myosin ATPS activity of type 1 fibers will be inactivated. That's why if you uh, pre-incubate the muscle fiber in a specimen for a while at alkaline condition, then if you perform myosin ATPS staining, only type 2 fibers are stained. And this will be reversed if you use acidic condition. In acidic condition, uh, myosin ATPS of Type 2 fibers will be inactivated, but type 1 fibers activity is still there. That's why only type 1 fiber will be stained. And if you increase the uh, pH a little bit, now type 2B fibers show a little bit of activity. And I, of course, I, you know, this is the academic or scientific explanation. But of course, we remember, okay, so alkaline condition, white one is type 1, dark one is type 2, something like this. Anyway, so this is how we, yes, interpret. And there are type 2C fibers. This is type 2C fiber is the immature or undifferentiated fiber, an abnormal fiber, okay? So before going further, I want to ask you, who decides, who determines the fiber type? This is a very important concept. So there are a lot of fibers. They say that, oh, I want to be type 1 or I want to be 2A. No. The one who determines the fiber type is motor neuron. So actually there are type 1 motor neuron, two, type 2A, type 2B. So if this is innovated by type 1 motor neuron, it will become type 1 fiber. Okay. So it means that, you know, through the developmental course, you know, until they are innovated, they don't know what type what fiber type they have to become, right? This situation, this condition, this stage is type 2C fibers. Then after that, it will be differentiated. So this is a very important concept. So practically how you, so type 2C fibers are defined by, identified by, you know, uh, well, I mean, the type 2C fibers are always stained at any condition, at any P pH. If you remember type 1 and normal type 1 and type 2 are inact inactivated in either acidic condition or in uh, alkaline condition. But type 2C fibers are always stained. This one, stained, 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 right? Actually, next door, this one is also stained, stained, stained. So there are, of course, many type 2C fibers because there. this is a, a muscle from Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And all regenerative fibers, most of the regenerative fibers are that's why you see a lot of type 2C fibers. And finally, I'd like to discuss this one. This, the distribution of fiber type is very unusual, right? We are supposed to see checkerboard pattern, but the whole area is type 1. Very strange, right? This is called fiber type grouping. And if the, you see this phenomenon, it means there is fiber, sorry, re innovation. I will tell you why in the next slide. But anyway, if you see re-innovation or fiber type grouping, you always see one or two type 2C fibers. This is another striking example. You see the whole area is type 1, that the other area is type 2, the fiber type grouping. But you see type 2C fibers, right? Why it, this happened? So again, fiber type is determined by motor. So one day, let's imagine that um, 
there was denervation like this. Then what's going to happen? Those fibers now denervated don't know what type. So they will first become type 2C fibers. Okay? And if nothing happens, they will just shrink. They will be just, you know, small and other, like small angular fibers. But this one, survived one, try to rescue them. This is called sprouting. They make new branches like this. So now these fibers will become under him, right? That's why the whole area will become type one. This is called fiber type protein. And this is, of course, re-innovation, right? Yes. And no, not all fibers are you know, immediately re-innovated. Sometimes one or two fibers are a little bit left behind. That's why you see one or two type 2C fibers. Yes, if it is still active one. But if you do, if you have a chance to look at the, like a post-polio syndrome or something, like a the patient who had polio like 30 years ago and for some reason received second biopsy. In that case, you see beautiful fiber type grouping without any type 2C fiber because everything has already finished. Okay? But if you, it is active, you usually see one or two type 2C fibers like this. Okay, that's all. And then I, we do like immunohistochemistry. I don't want to go into detail, but basically for the diagnosis of muscular dystrophy and myositis. Okay, this is my last slide. I talk, first talk about muscle biopsy and fixation. You need freeze fixation. And once frozen, you should never ever defrost it. Okay, it's not difficult, but if you don't follow the correct method, you will get arthritis always. And for histochemical stains, HNA is the most important. So I talked about this one. And but um, modified gomory trichome and NADH, they are also important ones. And myosin ATP is used to uh, analyze fiber type and in their in histochemical stains. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention.